Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, it's a little bit different than the fall back day, isn't it? Uh, a little darker this morning, and, and I'll, I wonder how many people, we'll see next uh, hour, how many uh, folks miss the uh, springing forward on that, but it is, uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be here early in the morning to spend some time worshiping the Lord, and uh, we want to continue our worship experience with a time of prayer, and uh, uh, let's pray for one another today. Let's pray for the church, pray for those who are on mission, uh, uh, traveling today to uh, uh, a vast uh, group of folks. Also, as we launch uh, into praying during Ramadan, we want to certainly uh, in, engage in that, and we want this to be a house of prayer, and we want to be a people of prayer. Any of you want to come and join me in the altar for this time of prayer, I would invite you to come as we go to the Lord and we ask Him to bless our gathering here. Let's pray that God would touch our hearts today and that lost people will be saved, that uh, people will be healed and encouraged and blessed in, in every way. Lord, it is good uh, to be with your people. It is good to be with you. Lord, thank you that we are always with you because you never leave us nor forsake us. And, and Father, we come to you today just proclaiming your greatness and worshiping at your feet. Lord, there is none like you, none besides you. You are great and mighty. You're high and exalted. Uh, Lord, we, we love you. We thank you that you have first loved us. And, and Father, we worship you today, and we give you the praise that is due your name. We rejoice in, in seeing uh, people baptized. We rejoice in reports of people who, whose hearts have been touched by you to, to travel to other parts of the world in order to share the good news of Christ and Lord, we, we thank you for those uh, examples and the, that encouragement that, that we so desperately need. And, and we stand in the gap for our friends that are suffering today or hurting, uh, grieving over, uh, over death, grieving over uh, circumstances that are, are difficult and challenging. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would uh, intervene in those situations, you would invade those circumstances, Lord, we know that Jesus makes everything better, that he is, he is the better way, He is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and, and Lord, we come to you through Him, and, and so we come in His name, uh, interceding for those who are sick, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, heal the sick, we pray, Lord, that you would encourage those that are uh, distraught and discouraged today, that you would lift them up out of the miry pit, you'd set their foot on a solid rock today. God, we ask that you would search our hearts and that you would know our ways. And if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, that we would confess that, repent of that. And Lord, we would walk in the everlasting way as a result of, of being cleansed by your blood on this day. God, we pray that you would sweep through us today, Lord, that we would experience awakening and revival, Lord, that you would get us out of the rut of routine, that you would get us out of the rut of... Of, of not expecting you to do anything. Lord, would you uh, shake us up as you uh, cleanse the temple in that day? Would you cleanse this temple, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, our lives? Would you cleanse our lives, God, that you would, your presence would be so obvious and evident among us that, that Lord, we, we could not stand in your presence with sin in our life. Lord, that you would eradicate that. I pray for those that will come today that desperately need you. They need hope. And Lord, we pray that the, the, the clarity of the gospel will be shared from this pulpit, in the songs that we sing, uh, in life group, in conversations in the hallway. Lord, that it would be, uh, today would be a day that the gathered church uh, worships you. And as a result of you being lifted up today, that you will draw all men to yourself. And oh God, we ask that you would help the preacher today as he preaches and that you would anoint him, use him, Lord, as, uh, and give us ears to hear what the, the Spirit has to say to us uh, as the church. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it to John's Gospel, chapter 2. And we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago in verse 13. And last week we 
made a little bit of a detour. We talked about treasure hunting, and we learned that where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And we want to continue to be, to be engaged in treasure hunting as we're uh, hunting for the gold in the Word of God. And that gold is certainly the Lord Jesus, and we're going to be learning more and more about Him even today. And just to remind ourselves a little bit of where we have come so far is that the first 18 verses are the, the prologue, uh, really talking about Jesus and his deity, and then he launches his ministry, and really that ministry is launched with John the Baptist's ministry. And then as we get to chapter 2, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the very first miracle that Jesus performed. He performed it at a wedding. It was that miracle of turning the water into wine, and today we're going to be uh, seeing that Jesus travels from, from that land to, to go to Jerusalem to observe the Passover, and then in the midst of that, he cleanses the temple, and we'll be talking about that. But, but John, in his gospel, he, he bridges these, and some of the goal that we want to, to discover in our study is really what Jesus is pointing to that just like in the, the wedding that Jesus affirmed marriage, and yet he also anticipated the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus took what were water pots that were not drinking water, but it was dishwater, so to speak. It was washing water. And he took those water pots and he transformed what was used for outward ceremonial cleansing and he transformed it to a wine that they would drink. And we know that Jesus would later in John 6 say that this wine is my blood. And we know at the, at the Lord's Supper, the Passover, he transformed that into the Lord's Supper and that that fruit of the vine was also this is my blood of the covenant. And so they went from washing water that you don't drink, to wine that you do drink that really uh, speaks of the spiritual cleansing. The outward cleansing of the water is transformed into a spiritual cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so there are some deep theological truths that John is, is showing us if we have the, the, the ears to hear it and the, uh, the spirit working in us to grasp what he's doing. And then as this Passover meal that Jesus goes to observe, and we know that Passover is a representative and it is commemorative in remembering back when the, the death angel passed over all of the doors that were covered with the blood of the lamb at the time of the Exodus. And they continued to observe that over and over again. And Certainly that's connected to the Lord's Supper, and so we know that connection there. And then the cleansing of the temple, we're going to see that Jesus, uh, he, he affirms uh, and, and, and shows his zeal and love and commitment to the temple uh, worship. And he cleanses us, cleanses it. We reminded of what happened in the first miracle. It was the water pots for cleansing. And so here Jesus is cleansing the temple. And then Jesus says that you'll destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And, and so, and he's talking about himself being the temple. And so there's much to, to grasp in, in these verses of scripture, much beyond just the, the reading of the text, just beyond of what is actually going on. God is doing a great work, and he is, in what he's doing, he is pointing ahead to a greater work that he will do on the cross, in the resurrection, and in the return of Christ. And so I want us to read this passage of Scripture, and we're going to be reading from John chapter 2, beginning in verse. 13, and if you are physically able to stand, I would invite you to stand with me right now as we read God's Word. The Bible says this, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days 
I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Father, thank you for your word that is true. It always accomplishes its purposes. It never returns void. And we thank you, Lord, that you know us and you know what is in us, and we pray that today that your word would cleanse us, your word would correct us, your word would encourage us. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. You can be seated. I wish we had a chart. I should have gone ahead and got something like that up there to to show the the wedding miracle, the Passover and the temple, and just see how Jesus Uh, affirmed the marriage but anticipated the marriage supper of the Lamb and how he transformed that uh, dishwater into uh, drinking wine that uh, uh, really was a picture of the blood of Christ that cleanses us. That was outward washing of the dishwater to the the inward cleansing of the blood of Christ and and, and, and seeing that transformation. And then how the, the Passover, that Jesus leaving the wedding, he comes to observe the Passover. And this Passover was something that that the Jews, there were three required festivals uh, every year that the Jews had to participate in. And at this time, there were probably uh, hundreds of thousands, if not as estimates, even up to a million uh, men that had come to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. And so Jesus is doing uh, that. And so the first thing that I want you to notice in our, in our study is that, uh, uh, that Jesus participated in fulfilling the law. And our approach to this passage is uh, not going to be WWJD, but it's going to be WDJD. What did Jesus do? Not, not what would he do, but what did he do as we walk through this? What did Jesus do? Well, the first thing that we see is that Jesus participated in fulfilling the law and that Jesus was an active participant in fulfilling law. He didn't just say the law is fulfilled, he fulfilled it. And here we see him personally observing the Passover. Now, let's look at verse 13. It says, the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, he was coming from the north of Galilee and Capernaum is where he was coming from. And so he's heading south. But if you're familiar with Jerusalem and the topography there, that Jerusalem is sitting up on a plateau. So uh, geographically, uh, he was going down. But to, uh, top, uh, as far as elevation goes, he's coming up uh, into Jerusalem. And he came out of obedience to the law to fulfill the law. But he also came, and we see that in the cleansing of the temple, that he came to inspect the spiritual condition of the people in that day and time. And that's what Jesus was always doing. And we know that Jesus, he uh, deliberately violated man-made religious laws of the Pharisees over and over again. But here we see him observing the Passover. And I think we can learn something from that because sometimes we, uh, we, uh, we tend to drift one way or another. We tend to be a non-traditionalist. And so we just almost rebel against anything that's somewhat traditional or historical or, or anything like that. And in doing that, we maybe miss out on understanding all that Christ has completed. Just like us looking at those water pots. I mean, it's like, oh, he turned water into wine. You hear water into wine, but but understanding, man, that uh, that was ceremonial washing water, and and it wasn't drinking water, and, and understanding the importance of that and the significance of that and what God is doing. And so understanding those traditions and understanding is of value. So we certainly don't want to be that person that's just always uh, uh, down on any kind of tradition or history or something like that. And then again, we need to understand that, that we worship Jesus, <laughs> that he is the fulfillment of everything. 
And we understand Jesus better by understanding sacrificial law and all those kinds of things. It's kind of like watching a game. And I know for years, for me, watching soccer, I remember I coached soccer and I didn't eat, I'd never even watched a soccer game because my kids wanted to play soccer and that's what, you know, they're growing up. So I'm going to, I mean, I didn't know the rules. I didn't know anything. And, and, and when you're watching something, you don't know anything about it, the rules. And uh, you may appreciate some talent. You may appreciate, uh, but you don't have any clue about strategy when there's a foul or a rule or anything like that. You don't know, you know, it's like watching hockey. I know some of you are hockey fans of icing. I don't even know what icing. I think icing is something you put on a cake or something like that. But, you know, all of these kinds kinds of things that are out there that the more you know about it, the more you can appreciate it and you can enjoy it. And so there is value in even understanding the, the Passover, and I think it's critical for us. And, and Jesus, he came to fulfill the law. The law was not bad. The law just could not save. And so Jesus came and he observed the Passover. He participated in the Passover. He was engaged in fulfilling the law so that we would not be under the burden of the law and the bondage of the law. He fulfilled it. And for us to even appreciate and understand what he's done on the cross and what he fulfilled and what he completed, it is important for us to grasp some of this. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, he participated in the Passover. And then we see really quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. The, the second thing I want you to see is that Jesus purified the temple he participated in the Passover, and then he purified the temple. He demonstrates his authority over the temple, and he had, uh, demonstrates his zeal for God in, in cleansing of the temple. Now, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they position their record of the cleansing of the temple at the end of Jesus' ministry, in that Passion Week. And some scholars say that John just moved it forward for his purposes. And, and I, I, don't, I really think that there was more than one cleansing of the temple. And many scholars believe that. And that's what I would choose to believe, that Jesus is cleansing the temple. Because I imagine that temple needed to be cleansed more than once. Does your temple need to be cleansed more than one time? So I think it's very logical at the, at the onset of his ministry, he came to the temple, he found that was going on, and, and I believe there's enough difference as you compare those that there's enough distinction there that and here we see uh, Jesus cleansing the temple. And, and, and what did he do? And, and, and there are several things that we notice about Jesus in the cleansing of the temple that Jesus is, is different in the temple cleansing than we are typically used to seeing him, that he is usually, we typically see him as patient and kind and gracious and loving. And as he's cleansing the temple, he's fiery. <laughs> uh, he is intolerant and he is uh, taking charge in, in every way. And one writer said this, that Jesus was infinitely gracious and he was inflexibly righteous. <laughs> And he was both of those. And I believe that John is peeling back the, uh, the curtains of eschatology, uh, letting us see a little bit of that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that John uh, would see on the uh, Isle of Patmos, the one coming riding the white horse, the one coming in, in victory and in judgment. And Jesus is certainly loving and caring, and yet he was also righteous in every way. But what is it that we notice that Jesus did? Well, the first thing is that, that he, Jesus found something in the temple. He found something in the temple. That means he was looking. He was observing, and he's noticing. And I believe that Jesus is always doing that. I, uh, I always remember we, the story where Jesus told exactly how much the, the widow gave, uh, and how did he know what she gave? Well, he was looking. <laughs> he was observing. He, he knew what was going on, and he knows what's going on in your life. He knows what, uh, what problems you have. He knows what sin you have, and Jesus is very much aware of everything going on. And verse 14 says that he found, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Listen, Jesus always finds us out. And uh, Jesus found something in the temple. And he found these people doing business in the temple. And it has been explained that 
People would travel, as I've already mentioned, people would travel long distances to come for the Passover. And there were a lot of people in town, if they would have to to bring their sacrificial animals with them, it'd make the journey even longer. Sometimes some of you, when you go on vacation, you you go to your vacation spot and then you go to the store, right, to buy the groceries and things like that. So you don't have to haul them all down there and then haul them all back. And those and that was kind of the what was going on, that it's what started out and, and certainly uh, history, some historians reflect that the, the selling of these uh, animals and all, that it started out outside the city and outside the, the gates of the temple and over time it just sort of worked its way in to this 14-acre area of the core of the Gentiles, and so they sort of set up camp there. And then over time, what had been originally a convenience became a money-making opportunity. It's kind of like when you go to Silver Dollar City or uh, uh, Disney World or someplace like that, and and all of a sudden, you know... uh, a dollar Coke becomes a $5 Coke, and a, you know, a dollar hamburger becomes a $10 hamburger. Well, probably not any dollar hamburgers anymore. I guess maybe if you go to McDonald's or something. But, uh, but you know, it's just, they got you. They don't let you bring anything in. They got you, and so they seized the moment, and, and that's what was going on. It became a, a place of business more than a focus on the, the worship of God. And so, the, the focus and the attention had shifted and changed, and that's what Jesus found. He found that going on, and, and Jesus can find that going on in our lives, in my life, in your life. Of, of, uh, he knows what's important. You know, I, through the years, as I would talk to people about Christ, they'd always say, well, you know, uh, the Lord knows. He said, I love the Lord, and I, I, and I always would say, I, I, I agree 100%. The Lord knows. <laughs> the Lord knows exactly. The Lord knows why you haven't been to church in, in, in two years. I mean, the Lord knows that. The Lord understands. Absol- the Lord understands everything perfectly. The issue is not the Lord understanding. The issue is do we understand? But the Lord found them in that situation. So he found something. But also we see that Jesus did something in the temple. He did something. That that he was active. And and we see these verbs in in verse 15. Made, drove them out, poured out, and overturned. And let's look at the verse. And he made a a scourge of of cords. And he drove them all out of the temple. And with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers. And he overturned the tables. I mean, he was engaged. He was involved. I mean, he was, he was a man on a mission. He was, uh, there, there wasn't any question about it. And he was, he was doing something. He was actively engaged. He found something, and then he, he did something about it. And, and Jesus, he, he did something. He died on the cross for our sin. He didn't just point out our sin. He didn't just talk about how bad sin was. But Jesus did something about it. He, he hung on a cross, and he shed his blood so that we might be saved. Jesus is a, an active participant in salvation, an active Savior in saving us. He is engaged in what is going on. And, and he did this amazingly all alone. I mean, you can imagine there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people in this area. And, and Jesus steps up, and you'd think somebody would step up. I mean, you'd think a crooked money changer would, you know, you'd think one of those boys would be a big old boy or something along that. You'd think one of them would be half outlaw and all those kinds of things. And, but Jesus, I mean, when he stepped up, he stepped up with great authority. The hand of God was upon his life. It was very obvious that he was doing the work of God. And he did it alone, and nobody challenged him as far as physically stopping him. He was an imposing person. He did this with great passion. Folks, I tell you, that's what we need today when it comes to our commitment to Jesus is passion. Man, we've had people passionate about everything. Man, passionate about pandemics, passionate about sports, passionate about everything. But I tell you what, there's a great void of passion for Jesus out there. There's a great void of passion for Jesus in here. We need to be more passionate about him than any of these other things. It's really ridiculous, and we wonder why we don't have revival. It's because our passions are are wasted on lesser things. But Jesus had a passion. He had a zeal for the house of God. He, He loved his Father. He was passionate about that. But not only did Jesus find something, Jesus did something, but also Jesus said something. 
Jesus always said something. Verse 16, the Bible says, and to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away and stop making my father's house a place of business. And Jesus, he was addressing the heart of the issue that that they were engaged in a business practice instead of worship of God. That that's the point behind them even being there was not to worship God or not to help others worship God. What could be a good thing of providing economical, uh, sacrificial animals and, and so that people can truly worship God and, and it became a place of business and, and profiteering and, and those kinds of things. But I do believe that Jesus in his passion for the zeal of the house of God, that in doing so, that he was foreshadowing and he was prophetically acting out the the authority that he will come back with at his second coming when he really cleans house. I started out, the the title of the message was When Jesus Cleans House, and I kind of like that a lot better, but I I think what Jesus does does works too. But but here we, we see the passion of him, and really he points out that my father's house is You've made my father's house a place of business. And in the synoptics, when he cleans the temple at the, at the end of his ministry, he uh, points out that my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations, quoting from Isaiah, the, the prophet. And, and what he's showing, and last week we, we looked at where Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, where your treasure is, uh, that's where your heart will be also. That, and then we're reminded of what Jesus said in Luke 16, He said, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And then in Luke 20, Jesus said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplace and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour widows' houses for appearance sake, offer long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. That is a a problem of our day is that uh, so many are engaged in self-promotion and uh, 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 self-greed-filled strategies and things like that. We've all got an angle on what we're doing and ulterior motives and things. And, and we need to be cautious about that. We need to be called into question. We need to encourage one another in that. And we defeat materialism and defeat uh, money and wealth. And listen, you don't have to have a lot of money for money to be your God. I mean, uh, it, 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 I've noticed through the years that uh, there are extremely wealthy people that are extremely generous and they're some people that don't have a lot of money and they're as stingy as you could get uh, and all of that and, and, and vice versa. There are generous people who don't have a lot of money and there are stingy people who do have a lot of money. It, it really, the, whether you have it or don't, is really not the, the deciding factor. It's the heart. It's the heart. It's the motive. And, and you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one of them and you'll despise the other. That, that's what Jesus said. And so we've got to decide who... Who our God is. That's why when Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler, uh, and 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 the rich young ruler mistakenly said, Jesus told him to keep all the commandments and all that. He said, well, I've done that, which we know he didn't do that, but he thought he did. He thought very highly of himself, but no doubt he was probably a pretty decent kind of guy. And then Jesus said what you would not expect him to say, well, then go and sell everything you've got and give it away, and then come and follow me. Because Jesus, as we're going to see at the end of this uh, narrative here, that Jesus, he knows us. He knows our heart. And he knew that that young, rich young ruler, that his God was his money. That's why he said, okay, that's your God, so go get rid of your God so you can, serve, you can follow me as God. And that's really what, what Jesus does with all of us. At some point in time, and uh, that, that we come to those those crises of faith moments where we, it, it's all out there and we, we get to decide there. It's laid out there that th- this is it. It's going to be your career. It's going to be this money. It's going to be this position. And you've got to decide, are you going to serve it or are you going to serve me? 
Who has first place? Because see, Jesus is God. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And when he comes into our life, he comes into our life as God. He didn't come as a, a, you know, kind of a minority partner uh, in in, in the thing, a a minority shareholder or something like that of of this deal, this idea, well, me and God, we got this. You know, God's my co-pilot. No, God's the pilot. And we just long for the ride. I mean, we're, uh, he's, he, he's in charge. As some have said, he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And so as Jesus came, these uh, religious leaders, they were certainly not seeing him as Messiah because they would see the Messiah coming to attack the Gentiles. And Jesus came and uh, he engaged the Jewish leaders of that day. And I think that's the challenge for some of us is that we need to understand and recognize as we read this biblical text that Jesus came after the religious of his day, and, uh, and, G- and we, need, we don't need to be that. We don't need to be that. We need to be followers of Jesus and not the religious elite. <laughs> we don't need to be the Pharisees and the scribes. We need to be the humble servants following after Christ, uh, seeking to please him, uh, realizing that we desperately need a sinner. So what did Jesus do after that? Well, the third thing I want you to notice is that Jesus provokes a response. And Jesus always provokes a response. Have you ever noticed that? If you, you, know, if you just talk in general terms about good and bad, or, or even, even say you know, God or even the Lord or something like that, that it usually doesn't cause too much uh, challenge. But man, when you bring up the name of Jesus... That's when the blood rushes to everybody's head. I mean, when you bring up the name of Jesus, that's when everybody's heart starts beating fast. That's when everybody starts getting a little sweaty. I mean, even when we bring it up, we, we, we start that. But the other people, it's that name of Jesus. Because you see, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name. There, there's no name like Jesus. He is highly exalted, that name, above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we bring up the name of Jesus. And so when Jesus is in the conversation, that it requires a response. And we see two different responses. One is that his disciples remembered the word of God. When, when Jesus engaged, when Jesus spoke, when Jesus did, when Jesus found, when, when he did all of that, it, 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 it caused a response. It provoked a response from people. And, and his disciples, they, they remembered Psalm 69.9, 9, zeal for, for your house will consume me, that, that Jesus was, was zealous for the house of God, the temple in that day. He, he was zealous for that. He was passionate for that. And, 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 and so it, they remembered that. And we see also in this text, we read just a few minutes ago, that when Jesus said, destroy this temple, in three days I'll raise it up, it said that when he was raised from the dead, his disciples believed. They, they remembered what he said. And followers of Jesus, the, the good news for followers of Jesus is that, that, that it's probably harder If you're a genuine follower of Jesus, to get out of God's will, then you think it is. Uh, You know, I I remember hearing uh, Howard Hendricks say that years ago when I was trying to figure out if God was calling me to preach, and I'm still trying to figure that out sometimes. I know some of y'all wonder, say, well, well, did you ever figure that out? But but I remember when I was really going through that and was at... In Memphis, in the uh, Jewish temple across the street from Bellevue, it was Mid America, uh, and I, I'd dri- driven there from Little Rock by myself, stayed in a hotel, and I was just wanting to hear from God. And and uh, man, that and he was doing a, a seminar on uh, the will of God. I thought, man, I'm going to that one. <laughs> that, that that's one I'm going to. And and he made the observation. He said it's probably harder. He said if you if you really want to obey God and you really are trying to please the Lord, it's probably harder to get out of the will of God than you think it is. And when you think about it is that God is, he orchestrates history. 
most of us, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get to decide who our parents were going to be, did we? I mean, we didn't get to decide that. We didn't get to decide the year we were going to be born. We didn't even get to decide what our name would be. I guess some of you can change your name. Some of you may have done that. But uh, we didn't, there's a lot of, about our life, so much about it is really outside our control. And most of us didn't get to hire ourselves a certain job and all of those kinds of things. And, and God is orchestrating things. And if we want to please the Lord then he is going to, uh, he's going to direct our path. And man, that's great news for followers of Jesus. And his disciples, they remembered the word of God. But the Jews, they questioned the word of God. They questioned his authority in verse 18. It says, the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And I mean, it, it may sound like somewhat of a benign statement, but you see, Jesus understood. He knew them. He knew their heart. And they didn't need a sign. They needed a heart change. They needed a, a compliant, repentant, humble heart is what they needed. Uh, they did not need a sign. They were cynical and skeptical and critical. Uh, I mean, Jesus had said it. It's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. And uh, I don't understand all of the things going on. I know that... Uh, uh, that uh, Thomas was, was given a sign. We, we saw earlier uh, that Nathaniel, uh, he, he, he asked a question and, and, and Jesus gave him what he needed. And Jesus gives us what we need. I, I certainly believe that. If you need something in order to believe and you will believe, God's going to give it to you. I, I believe that 100%. But by God knowing everything there is to know, he knows uh, if, you're just, if you've got a cynical heart and a skeptical heart and he's not going to put his... Uh, uh, pearls before uh, swine. So these people did not need another sign. They just needed a heart for God. They needed spiritual eyes to see God, to see what God is doing. And, and dear friends, I want to encourage you today. If you do not see the hand of God at work, if you do not see God moving and working around you, you need to beg God to give you spiritual eyes, that he would open the eyes of your heart that you might be able to know and see what God is doing. Because God is at work. And if you do not see that, it's because your eyes have been blinded by the God of this age. And you need to ask God to help you to see, help you to, to hear, help you to understand and comprehend. Well, what did Jesus do next? Well, the next thing he did, he prophetically proclaims a new resurrected uh, temple. In verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. He was speaking prophetically in that uh, the, they were destroying the purpose of the temple as a place of worship and, and carrying on business the way they did. So they were destroying that, and certainly the temple would be destroyed, literally, uh, in, in, a, in, in a, a few years, a few decades, it would be de literally destroyed. But, but he was talking about himself, and he was talking about his crucifixion. And so when he says that, he, he says, you'll destroy this temple, and he's anticipating his crucifixion. And in the same way, Jesus was anticipating his crucifixion when he turned the water into wine, and the wine and the fruit of the vine is the blood of the covenant. And it is the blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of sin. And so Jesus is pointing to and he's anticipating with his miracles, with what he's saying. He's anticipating the cross because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why we glory in the cross. That's why it is the necessity of the preaching of the cross. Because it is central to the Christian message. It is central to who Jesus is. Jesus is he, his cross and his resurrection. That's who he is. And you really can't have Jesus without the cross and without his resurrection and without his return. And so he spoke prophetically. And he is predicting his resurrection from the dead. And then they continue to question him. Ignorantly, looking at a, a you know, in a, a human plane, a, a literal physical temple that is taking place, and then John he clarifies that they're talking about the body, and so 
Jesus is saying that this body of mine is the temple. This is the temple. Jesus is giving new meaning to everything. This, this fruit of the vine, this is my blood. This body of mine, this is, I'm, the, I'm the temple. And the temple was a place where people would worship God, and Jesus is the place. He is the, the person in which and by which and through him that we worship God. So worship of God is not restricted to a geographic location because of the omnipresence of God and because of the fact that God lives in us, that we worship God in these earthen vessels. And we know that the Apostle Paul tells us that we are the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That God lives in us. That we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And so God is in us. And so this building that we live in is not a holy building, so to speak. I mean, we don't need to disrespect it or anything like that. But this is, I mean, God doesn't live in this building. If this building blew away or burned down tomorrow, the church goes on. Because God lives in us. And when nobody's in here, this is an empty building. God's presence does not reside in the brick and mortar and the roof and all of those things. God's presence resides in us. And by us being here means that God is here. And so that is the importance of the gathered church. So we, we see this new meaning, this new understanding. And, and, we're, and we get to John 4. We're going to actually spend several weeks in that. I, uh, I'm going to avoid the, the, the temptation of going where the Samaritan woman is instructed about worship. That we worship God in spirit and in truth. And she was worshiping God at Mount Jer- uh, Gerizim. And, 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 and Jesus was teaching her about worshiping God. And we see what Jesus did, but, uh, and we see what Jesus demands in a response. But then we also see what his disciples do. Verse 22 says that, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. They believe the scripture. They believe the word of God. God's disciples, Jesus' disciples, believe the scripture. That's one way you know that you're disciples, that you believe the scripture. If you don't, if you don't believe the scripture, you're not one of his disciples. His disciples believe the scripture. And his disciples believed in his name. And that's how we know we're a disciple. And that's the reason, the purpose behind everything that has been written in the Gospel of John, so that you may believe, and that by believing you will have life in his name. That's the very purpose that we have this, is so that we might believe. And his disciples do believe. It is the circular that it is evidence and proof, and yet it is the means by which we obtain our salvation, and yet it is the verification of our salvation that we believe, that we're believing in him, that we are trusting in him. And then in verses 24 and 25, it could be, it's really a new theme, kind of a a really short uh, paragraph, and uh, we're trying to get through John in less than five years, so uh, we kind of uh, bunch some of it uh, together here. It's it's somewhat of a shift, but, but it really just speaks also of the preeminence of Christ and who he is. And what we see in this is that, one, Jesus knows all people. Jesus knows people. Look at verse 24. It says, But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. He does not entrust himself to everyone. That there are those that Jesus did not entrust himself to because he knew their heart. He knew them. Jesus, I believe Jesus died for everyone. I believe Jesus died for everyone, but he did not entrust himself because he knew the hearts of people. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. 
And uh, we, need, we need to be real careful when we quote that verse if, if we're talking to somebody. <laughs> uh, because the, the problem is, for most of us, it's hard for us to tell the difference between who the who the swine are, you know. We can't always tell the sheep and the goats and all of that and the wheat and the tares. And so Jesus, in, in that parable, the wheat and tares, he said, just let the wheat and the tares, remember he said, let the wheat and tares, let them grow up side by side. And the reason he said that is because we're not smart enough to know who the wheat and tares are. I mean, we look, we look at David's life and about a year's worth of time and he's doing, he say, Man, there is no way that guy's a follower of the Lord God. <laughs> I mean, he's an adulterer, a murderer. I mean, he's about as bad a guy as you could ever be. We'd say, yeah, he's not saved. He's not God's chosen and, and all. And, and, and then there's going to be those who come to him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do many great works in your name? And he will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And so we're not, we're not real good at uh, uh, on this side of always knowing who the sheep and who the goats are, who the wheat and who the tares are. So at the end, the Lord, he'll, he'll do that. But here we see that Jesus, he did not tr- entrust himself to everyone. It's somewhat baffling uh, to some, maybe. Uh, it appears that many people believe the miracles of Jesus, but they just didn't believe in Jesus. People like the show. <laughs> they like the sideshow, but they didn't want their life transformed. They didn't want to follow him. They didn't want to surrender their life to him. Their faith was shallow, selfish, superficial, but not genuine. And so Jesus knows. And there were those that he did not entrust himself to. And he was also not dependent upon any human testimony. He didn't need anybody to tell him uh, who to entrust himself to and who not to entrust himself to. He did not need anyone to affirm him. <laughs> and, it, and in some ways, we need to remember that, that Jesus does not need us to defend him. Now, God in his sovereign plan has called us to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And we proclaim the truth of the gospel. And that's why God doesn't... The Bible has no uh, argument for the existence of God. It just starts out, in the beginning, God. It doesn't argue for the existence of God. It just says it. And we're, it just says, Jesus is Lord. And that's the truth. And there's nothing wrong with apologetics. Uh, we, we think apologetics are good because I, I think there are some people that have honest questions out there. But because Jesus knows our heart, Jesus also knows that there are a lot of dishonest people out there, deceived people, who really do not have a heart for God and have no real desire to follow God. They question Jesus instead of following Jesus. People who want the work of Jesus but not the word of Jesus to live in their life will not share in the life of Jesus. So in conclusion, we cannot worship God and anything else. It can be money, it can be our career, it can be fame, it can be selfish pleasure, uh, uh, it could be anything, but Jesus must be Lord. doesn't mean that we don't struggle, doesn't mean that we never sin, but in our heart of hearts, our longing and our desire and our passion is for the Lord. And when we, when we sin, it, it breaks our heart, and, uh, and we, we want to repent, we want to be right with God. It doesn't mean that we, we can't get it wrong, we can get it wrong, and we do get it wrong. And if we don't think we get it wrong, then we're like the Pharisees and we're full of pride and arrogance. But there should be something in you desiring him, pleasing him. Jesus, he came into the world and he purified the temple. And I believe today he wants to purify this temple, those temples. And that's what he wants to do. He wants us to be passionate for him. He wants us to be pure before him, that, can, and that purity only comes through the blood of Jesus, the shed blood of Christ on the cross.